This program is brought to you by Grand Valley State University. Most stories have two edges. So, because I followed then my fiance's nagging, because she said, how could you be a political science and never have read the greatest political novel ever written? I read it, she now, and I've read it, and I took off, and I've been writing and, on Robert Penn Warren. And she now tells people that I, have, I stole her project. <laughs> and uh, when she gives me new books to read or new articles to read, if I don't do them fast enough, she accuses me of ignoring her suggestions, and I remind her that I stole her major suggestion. So, uh, before I get to uh, all the King's men, I uh, just want to make a couple of comments. Today is Veterans Day, and um, uh, this is a sort of a personal uh, reminiscence concerning Veterans Day. My father wanted to get out of southwestern Pennsylvania, a beautiful part of the country that allows most people two options, farming land that should never be farmed, or going into coal mines. And he was the oldest of 11 children. When he was 19, he joined the Army. Uh, 30 years later, 1959, he was forced to retire uh, at the age of uh, 49. Amazing. He couldn't continue that uh, career. During World War II, he was in Europe, and my oldest brother's twin brother died. Uh, my father was not allowed to return for the ceremony, but my mother was living in Virginia, and my oldest brother, that I never met, uh, was buried in Arlington Cemetery. So when my father died in 1981, he was buried in the same plot as my oldest brother. When my mother died uh, a few years ago, she was buried next to my father in Arlington. Now, my father had a, a distinguished but not a remarkable career. He was like most soldiers. He did his job. He served his country. And I always think of uh, uh, him and my mother in Arlington as representing all of those millions of people through our history who have served, um, didn't ask for anything, but they did their duty. Um, when I went into the service right after my graduation as an undergraduate, my first duty station um, was in Charleston, South Carolina, very small army base. This was in 1969. And among my jobs was a survivor assistance officer. During my two years in Charleston, I uh, <clears throat> was involved in the funerals for 20 soldiers killed in Vietnam. And uh, I had five families of missing in action that I had to visit once a month. All five of those soldiers had been missing for five years or more. It was heart-wrenching. Um, Next time you go to Washington, if you have never visited the Vietnam Memorial, I encourage you to go because I think of all the memorials in Washington, to me, <clears throat> that's the one that's most appropriate because it honors the people who we should honor, those people who gave their all, some of them young, uneducated, not leaders, necessarily, but good, decent citizens. And then the second thing I want to say before I start talking about Robert Penn Warren is congratulations to you all for being part of the Leadership Academy. I have enjoyed the opportunity the last two days to read materials that uh, Gleaves provided for me, and I think it's a, an amazingly impressive program and one that will stand you in good stead. I particularly liked uh, Brian Flanagan's description of what uh, this program was designed to do. It involves competence, confidence, 
and contacts. Unfortunately, in our world today, some people are concerned only with number three, and they think that number three contacts can substitute for everything else. But I think that uh, Hauenstein Center has it in exactly the right order. Competence, master your trade. Confidence, not arrogance, but confidence. One of the things that you learn, I think, in uh, your leadership studies is that, uh, as Aristotle puts it, politics is not a theoretical science, it's a practical science. And that means that you don't learn a bunch of rules that you can then mindlessly apply, but you have to approach each, each situation and often make the best of a bad situation. That's where real confidence is, in being able to apply what you have learned. Contacts can be helpful, and as you go through your careers, you will become contacts. The mentoring program, I think, is an amazingly good part of this whole process. Learn from people who have some experience. Some of you, as you go through your lives, may find yourself in positions of putting other young men and women in harm's way. That's not an easy responsibility. Harry Truman's famous sign, the buck stops here, in some ways for me is the heart of leadership. Taking responsibility, making the best decision you can under the circumstances, and being faithful to those people who follow you. So with that, let me turn to uh, all the King's Men and ask very quickly, how many of you have read this novel or parts of it? I know that some of you have read parts of it. Has anybody seen? There have been two movie versions of All the King's Men. In 1949, a version starring Broderick Crawford won uh, the Academy Award for Best Film of the Year, and Broderick Crawford won the Best uh, Actor Award. A few years ago, Sean Penn did a remake of the novel. Um, so. Hopefully my talk will, uh, which focuses on uh, the political leadership of one of the characters in this novel, will encourage these. If, I, if I'm a good speaker, uh, then uh, it should encourage you, if you haven't read the novel, to go read it. Uh, I'll save a, some general comments about Robert Penn Warren for the uh, question session afterwards. So let me begin. Robert Penn Warren's All the King's Men tells the story of two men, Jack Burden, the book's narrator, and Willie Stark, Jack's friend and employer. Because I focus on the politics of the novel, Jack Burden appears only occasionally in this talk. This approach that I'm taking does not do justice to the richness of the novel, for as Jack himself says, his story and Willie's story are really one story. With this, this limitation in mind, I will now turn to a review of Willie Stark's career. Willie Stark, the political protagonist of all the King's men, is a reluctant but earnest young politician who returns quickly to private life after his initial failure to achieve reform at the local level. Through a matter of chance, he returns to the public eye, becomes convinced to run for governor of his state, and is used by a political machine in an effort to undermine its opposition and ensure its continuation in office. During the course of this campaign, Cousin Willie, as Jack Burden refers to Stark, receives his political education. After learning that he was being used by his party, he turns the tables by becoming a spokesman for the Hicks, whose votes were necessary for election, but whose interests the machine ignored. During the course of this revitalized campaign, Cousin Willie is transformed into the boss. He is eventually elected governor, and after a turbulent administration and successful effort to fend off impeachment, is assassinated. The stages of Willie Stark's career and the details of his term as governor provide the material for us to examine the foundations and nature of his political agenda and the grounds for his ultimate failure. I will examine Stark's rhetoric and his actions and conclude with an argument concerning political teachings in fiction. First, Willie Stark's rhetoric. His upbringing was similar to many others who grew up in rural America in the early 20th century. He was raised on a farm, attended a year of college, was in basic training in Oklahoma when World War I ended, married, fathered a child. 
The young Stark exhibits many of the characteristics of talented but poor children who are committed to succeeding in life through great odds. Single-minded focus, tremendous self-discipline, and an almost maniacal drive. Stark's entry into politics is a matter of happenstance. He is elected treasurer in Mason County because Dolph Pil Pillsbury, the chairman of the county commission, who was a sort of second-hand relative to Willie's father, had had a falling out with the original candidate for treasurer and needs someone to replace him. Pillsbury offers Willie the position. Having lucked into his first political role, Stark runs headlong into the reality of local politics in Mason County. The county is planning to build a schoolhouse and the local commission selects J.H. Moore, a builder who had not submitted the low bid and who has a reputation for using inferior materials in his work as contractor. Treasurer Stark opposes this decision and he makes enough of a fuss to attract the attention of the Chronicle, the leading newspaper in the state capital. While Stark receives some statewide publicity for his opposition, he also attracts the county commission's ire. In retribution for Stark's audacity, his wife Lucy is fired from her teaching job and Pillsbury, the local boss who had handpicked Stark, works to ensure that he will be a one-term county treasurer. Willie runs for re-election, but the political machine thwarts his campaign. His defeat is, a true, is achieved partly through racial politics. The low bid firm used African American laborers and Willie was accused of being unfaithful to the white race. The county machine also used strong arm tactics to defeat Stark. The local paper would not print stories on his campaign or even print his political flyers in their commercial, commercial print shop. Stark has his flyers produced in another town, but the boy he hires to distribute them is beaten up and the flyers are destroyed. Lucy and Willie react differently to his defeat. Lucy says, now honey, you didn't want to be mixed up with them anyway, not after you found out they were dishonest and crooked. Willie, however, broods with resentment. They tried to run it over me. They just figured I'd do anything they told me, and they tried to run it over me like I was dirt. Willie's attitude will be an important catalyst in his later success, as seen in an important speech that he makes in which he tells the people that he knows their heart because he is just like them. After his defeat as county treasurer, Stark finds non-political ways to employ himself. He farms, he sells household goods door to door during the day, and he studies law at night. While he prepares for the bar examination, an important event occurs that changes his uh, whole life. There is a fatal accident at the schoolhouse built by J.H. Moore. During a fire drill, the fire escape ladder collapses, injuring a dozen and killing three children. This event precipitates Stark's political resurrection, not because he seeks office in the immediate aftermath of this local disaster, but because his reputation for honesty spreads throughout the county and beyond. Stark exercises his political muscle by campaigning against the incumbent congressman, a former ally of Pillsbury. Jack Burden thinks Stark is effective in this campaign, but not because he was a good speaker. Burden says, Willie's speeches weren't any good, at least the one I heard wasn't any good. They didn't, have, they didn't have to be good. People didn't bother to listen to them. They just came to look at Willie and clap and then go vote against the Pillsbury man. This re-entry into politics prompts former Governor Joe Harrison to attempt to take advantage of Stark's popularity to split current Governor Sam McMurphy's rural vote in the Democratic primary, thus giving Harrison the victory. It is during this campaign that Willie articulates a political program for the first time, a program that could be characterized as a southern populist platform. Willie's program includes tax and economic reform, improved roads, especially in rural areas, efficient and economic administration, and better schools. Jack Burden recalls that Willie's speech has consisted of a weird mixture of facts and figures on the one hand and fine sentiments on the other hand. Willie is both earnest and uninspiring during the early phase of the gu gubernatorial campaign. After, after listening to one speech, Jack tries to give Willie some advice. Maybe you try to tell them too much. It breaks down their brain cells. When Willie protested, well, it looks like they'd want to hear about taxes, though, Jack persists. You tell them too much. Just tell them you're going to soak the fat boys and forget the rest of the tax stuff. Despite the ineffectiveness of the speeches, the platform Willie articulates in this campaign stays with him for the remainder of his political career. 
He may have refined or enlarged it at various points of his life, but Willie never repudiates this initial formulation of his political program. He also remains politically naive. Initially, he does not realize that Har the Harrison machine is using him to throw the election in its direction. So caught up in the grandeur of running for governor, he does not wonder why Tiny Duffy, a hack politician who had previously shown no interest in his career, courted him to run. As the campaign progresses, Willie inadvertently learns the truth from the political operative sent by the Harrison people to run the campaign. This revelation has a dramatic impact on Willie and the effectiveness of his campaign because it leads to the resurfacing of redneck resentment, not as something incidental to his campaign, but as, as its emotional core. When Willie raises, arises to deliver his campaign speech in Upton, just after he learns that he was being used to splinter the rural vote, he jettisons his stump speech and hits a note of populism that remains with him throughout his career. I have a speech here. It's a speech about what the state needs. But there's no use telling you what the state needs. You are the state. You know what you need. Well, he then tells the uh, crowd his story, including his fight over the schoolhouse contract and Harrison's plan to use him to split the rural vote. He turns on Tiny Duffy, who was sitting on the stage behind him, forces him off the edge of the stage, and then delivers his most powerful message. Whatever a hick wants, he's got to do for himself. Nobody in a fine automobile and sweet talking is going to do it for him. Willie then withdraws from the primary and, uh, and supports McMurphy against Harrison. Willie campaigns hard for, Mc, uh, for McMurphy, but it is not a, uh, assistance designed to let McMurphy rest easy. It's also a challenge. Jack Burden describes the speeches Willie makes during this part of the campaign. Go and vote, he told them. Vote for McMurphy this time, he told them, for he is all you got to vote for. But vote strong, vote enough, and show what you can do. Vote him in, and if he don't deliver, nail him up. In these speeches, Willie intentionally rouses the crowd's anger by addressing them as friends, rednecks, suckers, and fellow hicks. He then immediately identifies himself with the crowd. That's what you are. And me, I'm one too. I'm a redneck, for the sun has beat down on me. I'm a sucker, for I fell for that sweet-talking fellow in the fine automobile. I'm a hick, and I am the hick who was going to try, they were going to try to use to split the hick vote. After the call to support McMurphy, but to hold him accountable, Willie pounds home his real message. This is the truth. You are a hick, and nobody ever helped a hick but the hick himself. Up there in town, they won't help you. It is up to you and God and God helps those who help themselves. He then turns to a discussion of his program, but in this new presentation of his program, he admits all the facts and figures that have cluttered his earlier speeches. You ask me what my program is? Here it is, you hicks, and don't forget it. Nail them up. Nail up Joe Harrison. Nail up anybody who stands in your way. Nail up McMurphy if he don't deliver. Nail up anybody who stands in your way. You hand me the hammer and I'll do it with my own hand. Nail him up to the barn door. McMurphy wins the election. And Willie goes home to Mason County uh, City to practice law. McMurphy does not deliver. And four years later, Willie runs for the gubernatorial nomination in the Democratic Party. <coughs> when it was over, as Jack observed, there wasn't any Democratic Party. There was only Willie. Thus, Willie Stark becomes governor of the state. As governor, he begins to enact his program. Without the support of the old elite or the remnants of competing political machines still occupying legislative seats, there is much opposition to Stark's programs, which contain a litany of redistributionist reforms, establishment of an extraction tax, increased royalty rates for leasing state land, income tax reform, a highway program, and a public health bill. But he pushes them through the legislature. The state Supreme Court upholds all of those challenged in court. As Judge Irwin, a member of the old elite courted by the governor, explained, Stark understood that you don't make omelets without breaking eggs and precedents. Midway between his, uh, uh, through his first term, Stark faces an impeachment effort orchestrated by McMurphy's forces in the legislature. The charges allege that Governor Stark had attempted to, quote, corrupt, coerce, and blackmail the legislature and accuse Stark of malfeasance and nonfeasance of duty. The governor's strategy in defeating these charges was twofold. First, to give speeches around the state to garner popular support for his administration, and second, 
to blackmail enough members of the legislature to defeat the impeachment resolution. Stark increases the level of rhetoric in his anti-impeachment speech. I have seen blood on the moon, buckets of blood, and boy, I know whose blood it is. He then reaches out as if grabbing something and shouts, give me that meat axe. With the meat axe metaphorically replacing the hammer, the stakes of victory and defeat have become greater, perhaps a matter of life and death. In another part of the speech, Willie testifies to the foundation of his political vision and the source of his strength. Willie asks the crowd, have I disappointed you? Have I? He then instructs them, don't answer until you look into the depth of your heart to see the truth. For there is where the truth is, not in a book, not in a lawyer's book, not on any scrap of paper, in your heart. The scrap of paper, of course, to which Willie refers is the state constitution. The source of Willie's power is his knowledge of what, the peop what is in the people's hearts. Willie emphasizes the importance of this knowledge throughout his career. His campaign posters feature his picture, signature, and a motto that declares, my study is the heart of the people. This study, essential to the statesman, does not necessarily lead to a univocal understanding of what should be done, however. The study of the heart of the people takes one down a path that forks and can end either in the conservatism of Edmund Burke or in the radicalism of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. On the eve of the impeachment vote, Stark speaks at a rally on the state capitol's lawn. He enlarges his vision of health care for the state by announcing his plan for a new hospital. I'm going to build a hospital, the biggest and finest money can buy. It will belong to you. Any man or woman or child who is sick or in pain can go to those in those doors and know that all will be done that man can do to heal sickness, to ease pain, free, not as a charity, but as a right. It is your right. Do you hear? It is your right. I think I've heard that recently. <laughs> then he outlines other rights he claims for the people. A complete education for every child. A support program for the aged and infirm. Free access, paved roads, tax relief for the poor, and payment of fair taxes by the rich. The final right that Willie mentions is a, of a different order, you, that you shall not be deprived of hope. In tone, this final right is reminiscent of Franklin Roosevelt's fourth freedom, the freedom from fear. After again calling for the meat ax to smite his opponents, hip and thigh, shin bone and neck bone, kidney punch, rabbit punch, uppercut and solar plexus, Willie emphasizes his role as the people's advocate. Your will is my strength, your need is my justice. Stark defeats the impeachment vote and is re-elected to a second term as governor. After his re-election, he reinvigorates his agenda by immersing himself in all of the details of the hospital, such as working with the architects and choosing uh, its director. He is beginning to make plans to run for the U.S. Senate when Adam Stanton, the man he selected to be director of the hospital, shoots him. Having shown a certain consistency in Willie Stark's rhetoric and program, I now examine the operations of his administration. As already noted, Stark's opponents accused him of corruption and he faces impeachment based on these charges. I will examine the Stark administration with a goal of uncovering the nature of its corruption. Lord Acton famously said, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This statement may be true, but it does not give us any insight into the nature of the corruption to which power leads. It may be helpful to catalog examples of corruption found in all the king's men in an effort to understand the nature of political corruption. Jack Burden provides an entry point into this issue in an di in internal dialogue he has on the sources of illegal activity. I asked myself the following question. For what reason, barring original sin, is a man most likely to step over the line? I answered, ambition, love, fear, money. Burden's framework includes two levels of causality as to why men commit e evil or illegal acts. The first level focuses on the question of human nature. Burden's use of the theological concept of original sin suggests that humans have an innate bent toward evil or selfish acts. As Willie says, Man is conceived in sin and born in corruption, and he passeth from the stink of the deity to the stench of the shroud. There's always something. Burden's second level 
focuses the issue more narrowly and perhaps more superficially than does the general question of human nature. This level attempts to uncover specific triggers that lead to improper behavior, and Jack identifies four categories, ambition, love, fear, and money. One way to think of these categories is a, as examples of the human inclination, uh, the natural inclination of the human heart toward evil. From another perspective, however, this list also comprises a list, at least some of the temptations that might distract even the most virtuous soul from fulfilling its obligations. This level of analysis is essential in dealing with the issues of individual responsibility, for responsibility only exists in situations in which we are confronted with a real choice. If the devil, or God, made me do it, I can't be held accountable for my actions, for they aren't really my actions at all. Characters in All the King's Men reflect each of these interests. The desire to acquire money motivates Judge Irwin and Byram White. Anne Stanton and Sadie Burke act on love, or more specifically, desire. Countless politicians, some named and some unnamed, fear blackmail. Ambition drives other political figures. Tom Stark, Willie's son, who appears first in the novel as a baby and dies as a quadriplegic after a football injury, best represents original sin by displaying the arrogance of total self-absorption. Willie Stark, however, does not fit easily into any of these categories. He maintains an admirable self-discipline as a self-made man and is committed to certain goals throughout his career. Stark does not betray his principles, at least not explicitly, for political gain. The critic John Burt writes, the most difficult thing about Willie Stark is the sincerity of his devotion to his ends. In early 1933, just two and a half years after his election, his administration had instituted five major reforms. It had established an extraction tax, increased the royalty rate on state line, enacted income tax reform, implemented a highway program, and passed a public health bill. Although Willie's overt commitment to his political program remained, when he is elected governor, his decisions reflect subtle changes at the level of practical politics. He forms an alliance with the remnants of the Harrison machine that had tried to use him to split the rural vote. He selects Tiny Duffy, Harrison's agent in this earlier effort, to be highway commissioner. Later, he chooses Duffy as, uh, Duffy as his lieutenant governor. Stark remains committed to his program, but he mo his move suggests that something other than Lucy's devotion to honesty motivated him. He learns that to be effective in politics, it is not enough to be merely right about ends and decent about means. He claims that your justice, your need is my justice, is perhaps more than a rhetorical flourish and points to the constant foundation for his ever-shifting political decisions. As the impeachment movement against Willie moves toward its climax in the third year of his first term, he adds to his commitment of, uh, to public health by promising a new free hospital. He makes it clear to those around him, everything about this hospital, from its construction to its staffing, will be untainted by political considerations. For this reason, Willie resists Tiny Duffy's efforts to give the hospital contract to Gummy Larson, a construction executive with ties to McMurphy. Willie's stance on the hospital leads Jack Burden to reflect on an apparent contradiction in Willie's thinking that is essential to understanding the nature of the corruption of the Stark administration. Stark tells Adam Stanton, his choice as director of the hospital, that one has to make good out of badness because there isn't anything else to get it out of. After leaving Stanton and Governor Stark, Jack reflects on this idea. So I lay back and thought of Adam and the truth and of the boss and what he said the truth was, the good was, the right was, and lying there, lulled in the Cadillac, I wondered if he believed what he had said. He had said that you have to make good out of bad because that is all you have got to make it out of. Well, he had made some good out of some bad. The hospital, the Willie Stark Hospital, which was going to be there when Willie Stark was dead and gone, as Willie Stark had said. Now, if Willie Stark believed that you always had to make the good out of the bad, why did he get so excited when Tiny just wanted to make a logical little deal with the hospital contract? Why did he get so heated up just because Tiny's brand of bad might get mixed up with the raw materials from which he was going to make some good? Can't you understand the boss had demanded of me, grabbing me by the lapel? Can't you understand either? 
I'm building this place, the best in the country, the best in the world, and a bugger like Tiny is not going to mess with it. And I'm going to call it the Willie Stark Hospital, and it will be there for a long time after I'm dead and gone, and you are dead and gone, and all those sons of bitches are dead and gone. That was scarcely consistent. It was not at all consistent. I would have to ask the boss about it sometime. Although Jack plans to ask the governor about this discrepancy, he never does. It is a key question, however, and one that must be asked. I will offer a tentative explanation of Stark's inconsistency. Stark understands the different dimensions of meaning of public policy, and he understands that they can conflict. For purposes of this discussion, I distinguish just two dimensions of public policy, the statement of goals and the implementation of programs. Willie's populist agenda, the statement of goals and arguments for economic and social reforms to benefit the common person, is consistent throughout his career. Both John Burt and other critics forcefully make this point, but fail to consider the possibility that Stark's actions in implementing his program actually undermine his stated goals. This becomes clear in the encounter between Stark and Gummy Larson, after Stark has finally agreed to let the hospital contract go to Larson's company. The boss stood directly in front of him, the bodies almost touching. Then he seized Larson by the lapels and thrust his own flushed face down to the gray one. Arranged, he said, yeah, it's arranged, but you, you, leave out one, uh, you leave one window latch off, you leave one piece of iron out of the concrete, you put in one extra teaspoon of sand, you chip one piece of marble, and by God, by God, I'll rip you open, I'll... And still clutching the lapels, he jerked his hands apart sideways. A button from Larson's coat, which had been buttoned up, spun across the room and bounced on the hearth with a little click. Willie Stark was a country boy whose rise in politics could be attributed to his opposition to corrupt contracting practices in Mason County, whose election as governor could be traced to his opposition to the shoddy construction of the first brick schoolhouse in Mason County. Although his origins were always in the back of his mind, and while his heart remained with the simple country folks, people he consistently called hicks and rednecks, who elected him, his administration's practice changed from nailing them up to doing business with those he initially opposed. The intensity of Stark's threats to Gummy Larson is an indication that Stark reacts not only against previous administration's practices and hypothetical dangers, but also against his own administration's practices. John Burt recognizes that Willie's cynicism threatens to undermine his agenda, but argues that we don't know if this actually happened. Stark's warning to Larson and his irritation at Jack Burden's cynicism regarding the hospital, however, are evidence that at the implementation phase, Stark's program has been undermined in other areas. It is easy to imagine, for example, miles of concrete slab highway being poured without insertion of the iron rods necessary to hold the road together. Willie's defense of the purity of the hospital is his one remaining tie to a full commitment to serving the common people who had launched his career. What particularly irritates Stark is the suggestion that he is building the hospital merely to win votes. Trading services for votes, or more cynically, buying votes, may be seen as the way politics is normally done, an unfortunate but widespread practice in democratic politics. But if we trade defective services for votes, we move toward the realm of corruption because one side is no longer upholding its end of the political agreement. All the King's Men contains suggestions of, uh, of and examples of this type of corruption, both outside and inside the Stark administration. The defective schoolhouse that launches Stark's career is perhaps the prime example in the novel. Several characters in the novel accuse Stark of the grab, skimming money from state revenues for personal uses. An example of the grab is the case of Byram White, the state auditor who was found to be stealing state funds. Stark decides to protect White, not because White is innocent of the charges leveled, but because Stark thinks that removing White will encourage his opponents to come after his governorship. This type of corruption, poor quality of goods and services and embezzlement, can be found throughout the Stark administration. Is this all there is to the novel, the lesson that power almost invariably leads to petty corruption? Such a conclusion, I think, belies both the moral force of the novel and ignores Jack Burden's unasked question concerning Stark's seeming inconsistency. After Adam Stanton shoots Stark, the governor tells Jack, it might have all, <coughs> might have all been different. 
Indeed, before he was shot, Stark had begun to make personal and political changes that reflected a renewed commitment to not just the rhetoric, but to the reality of his populist vision. A typological approach to political corruption, whether based on Jack Burden's categories of original sin, ambition, love, fear, and money, or on the more scholarly standards of conflict of interest, nepotism, illegal conversion of public into private goods, may miss the deepest forms of corruption. The British political philosopher Michael Oakeshott points toward deeper and subtler forms in his essay, The Claims of Politics. A limitation of view which appears so clear and practical, but which amounts to little more than a mental fog, is inseparable from political activity. A mind fixed and calloused, all subtle distinctions, emotional and intellectual habits, become bogus from repetition and lack of examination. Unreal loyalties, delusive aims, false significances are what political action involves. And this is so, not because the politically active are under the necessity of persuading the mentally obtuse before their activity can succeed. The spiritual callousness involved in political action belongs to its character and follows from the nature of what can be achieved politically. Political action involves mental vulgarity, not because it entails the concurrence and support of those who are mentally vulgar, but because the false simplification of human life implied in even the best of its purposes. The ultimate corruption of politics, Oakeshott suggests, is in taking the realm of politics to be the most significant realm of human life and converting everything into life into mere political material. In his introduction to the modern library edition of All the King's Men, Warren reflects on the internal tension of the novel as envisioned during the early stages of writing. The protagonist was to be a man whose power was based on the fact that somehow he could vicariously fulfill some secret needs in the people about him. As the politician was good at fulfilling these secret needs, he rose to great heights of power, only to discover more and more his own emptiness and his own alienation. Seen from this perspective, All the King's Men is a novel about the idolatry of political life that places politics above all other aspects of human con existence. This is a novel about the natural limits of politics as a field of human endeavor. Willie Stark can save everyone except himself, but even this view is an illusion. It only appears that Willie can save others. This is shown clearly in an exchange between Willie and Lucy when he decides to name the hospital after his injured son, Tom. I'm going to name the new hospital for him, for Tom. I'm going to call it the Tom Stark Hospital and Medical Center. It'll be named for Tom. And she was slowly shaking her head and his words stopped. Those things don't matter. Oh, Willie, don't you see? Those things don't matter. Having somebody's name cut on a piece of stone, getting it in the paper, all those things. Willie, he was my baby boy. He was our baby boy. And those things don't matter. They don't ever matter, don't you see? Although those things perhaps should not matter. For most people, they matter a great deal. This is the nature of idolatry to place attention and faith in things unworthy of that attention and faith. This, however, is the ultimate corruption of political thinking. This is why Oakeshott concludes his essay, political activity involves a corruption of consciousness from which a society has continually to be saved. One way for political scientists to approach literature is to treat a literary work as a kind of essay that contains a teaching a set of propositions or principles to be learned in the form of a puzzle they must, that must be solved to find the correct answer. This approach confuses poetry with philosophy and misses the advantage that poetry has over philosophy. Poetry or literature can capture the complexity of reality by holding in tension the ambiguities and contradictions found in life. Rather than looking for the teaching of the novel, the lesson the author intends the reader to take away from it, I suggest that we need to seek the story's meaning. A novel's meaning may entail many lessons, some of them in conflict with others, just as there are multiple and contradictory lessons of history. Such meaning can be approached from two directions. First, articulating meaning requires that we confront the world of the actors and forces that we find in the novel and try to make sense of them. Second, Meaning can be found in the underlying structures of existence found in the novel. An example of such an underlying structure is Jack Burden's comment to Anne Stanton late in the novel. 
If you could not accept the past and its burden, there was no future. For only out of the past can you make the future. I have offered to you a partial reading of all the King's men. I've int uh, intentionally narrowed my focus to Willie Stark's political career. I've ignored, except incidentally, Jack Burden. And the novel is as much Jack's it is, as it is Willie's. I have ignored Willie's private life, except as it touches on his political career. I have ignored most of the characters in the novel in order to trace Willie's rise and fall. But in doing all this, I have omitted most of the richness the novel offers. Any search for the meaning of all the king's men would need to reinstate all of those elements of the novel that I have ignored. I have argued that all the king's men deals with the limits of politics and have placed this argument within the framework of Lord Acton and Michael Oakeshott. The Actonian insight that power tends to corrupt is an implicit criticism and challenge to the classical understanding of the efficacy of political action in shaping the virtuous soul and the good society, and suggests that regimes encounter moral friction and continually risk slipping into corruption as they strive to achieve their political goals. But even this is not the ultimate position from which to view all the king's men. For the novel is not merely a knee-jerk rejection of politics. This is not surprising in light of the novel's epigram taken from Dante's Purgatorio, as long as hope keeps the least bit of green. Near the end of the novel, Jack Burden hints that he may return to politics by assisting Hugh Miller, who had resigned his position as Attorney General in the Stark administration in a run for office. The fact that Jack even considers the possibility of returning to politics after witnessing the rise and fall of Willie Stark suggests that he believes the world of politics offers some hope. This possibility, too, must be kept in mind as we search for the meaning of this rich and challenging novel. Thank you for your attention. Since you're a veteran classroom teacher, go ahead. We're your classroom. Comments, questions? <coughs> Has anybody ever read a biography of uh, Huey Long? I was going to say this was based on I was to talk a little bit about that because one question, what all of you as members of the Leadership Academy should say, be saying to yourself is, why is this guy talking to us about a novel? Why isn't he talking to us about George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Woodrow Wilson, Teddy Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan, FDR, Barack Obama, you choose your historical figure. And I would suggest that um, if, you read a, if you read a biography of, take for example, David McCullough's massive uh, John Adams, in reading that, you're engaging in exactly the same process you are as in reading a novel. For all you know, John Adams could be a fictive character. And David McCullough could have a wonderful imagination in which he created all of those letters, diaries, experiences, events. Because, because for us, the closeness to John Adams is exactly the same as the closeness of us to Willie Stark. It's the page. And it's our engaging that person and his thoughts. So I would argue that reading a novel, a good novel, that shows the complexities of life is equivalent to reading the biography of your favorite leader. But All the King's Men was, uh, it happens that Robert Penn Warren was teaching at Louisiana State University when Huey Long was governor of the state of Louisiana. Now, Warren stated throughout his career that this was not simply a fictional portrayal of Huey Long, and I uh, tend to agree with that. What he, but the trajectory of his life, Huey Long, self-made man, became governor of the state, became tyrant, uh, laid the line for a long succession of longs, long after he was gone. Huey Long was actually elected to the Senate of the United States. Franklin Roosevelt thought his primary threat in the 1936 election was not from 
wasn't from poor Herbert Hoover, but was from Huey Long, who was going to outflank him, not on the right, but on the left. Governor, uh, Senator Long continued to run the state of Louisiana. He would take breaks from his Senate work and go back when the, uh, uh, the uh, Louisiana legislature was in session to make sure that they were still doing things right. And he was assassinated while attending one of those sessions. So some people argue that uh, it's just uh, Huey Long, and since Huey Long was a fascist, there's no point in paying attention to the novel, but it seems to me that it's a much deeper novel, especially when we think about uh, the other character. The other character, who I haven't talked about, but I will for a second because he shares something with all of you. Huey was a self-made man. He had minimal education, but he was an autodidact. He taught himself law. He didn't even apprentice with anybody. He studied the law books up in his room at night. Uh, so everything he knew, he basically learned from experience and by his own reading. <clears throat> but Jack Burden shared something in common with you. He was educated. He was actually pursuing a PhD in history. At the time, he's telling this story. He hasn't completed it yet. He might someday. He's got a dissertation sitting over there somewhere that might be finished. But Jack is an interesting character because he goes to work for Governor Long and he does all kinds of terrible things. He's the primary agent of blackmail. He delivers the envelopes to people. Pictures of what they've been seen doing. And, but he also, interestingly enough, said, you know, I don't take any action. I'm just a, he describes himself as a piece of the furniture. I'm a desk, I'm a typewriter, I'm a filing cabinet. And his part of the story involves his coming to understand what responsibility is. And I didn't even talk about that at all. Now it seems to me that those two parts of the story, I'm much more interested in Jack Burden's part of the story for various reasons. Because we learn some, we all, only see uh, Willie from a distance, right? We never get inside of Willie. It's always Jack telling us. It's always Jack. We can get inside of Jack. But Robert Penn Warren himself was irritated with people like me because he thought the really interesting character in the novel was Willie and he just used Jack. He made Jack up because he needed a way to get the story started. But I, my view of good works of fiction is <clears throat> that they are bigger than whatever their authors intend. And they take on a life of their own. And once he's written the story, he doesn't have any more say as what it means than, than any of the rest of us. Um, he's just another interpreter, because he had a shot until he published. Then it's no longer his. It's now, it's now belongs to all of us. Um, I have to, because uh, years ago I, I quoted uh, something else from uh, Michael Oakeshott that, uh, that Gleaves likes. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, at least quote this to you, another comment on the nature of uh, politics. Uh, and it's worth, it's worth thinking about, especially in, uh, in a regime of self-government. One of, uh, one of the things I enjoyed reading yesterday was uh, Gleaves' column about how Teddy Roosevelt saved college football. I'm big on sports stories. One of my favorite sports stories <clears throat> involves self-government. It involves Babe Ruth. One ambition that Babe Ruth had that was never fulfilled was he wanted to become the manager of a major league team. He wanted to become the manager of the Yankees. Now, if you know anything about Babe Ruth's life, he was a larger-than-life character. He ate, drank, you know, when the Barry Bonds uh, steroids business was going on, I thought that the, the real asterisk should have gone next to Babe Ruth's name, and it should have said 300 of his home runs were hit when he was under performance debilitating substances. Because he was <laughs> drunk, he overate. That's the, the shows what an amazing athlete he, he was. He could totally abuse himself and still be amazingly successful. But he had a famous confrontation with the owner of the Yankees, Colonel Rupert. And Rupert's question is a question, the question of self-government. He said, Babe, how can you expect to manage a team when you can't manage yourself? So self-government is, as, as our revolutionary ancestors knew, self-government requires 
eternal vigilance. The job is never over. And this is a quotation from Michael Oakeshott that I, I like a lot. Uh, may seem a little too skeptical for some of you. In political activity, men sail a boundless and bottomless sea. There is neither harbor, nor shelter, nor floor for anchorage, neither starting place, nor appointed destination. The enterprise is to keep afloat on an even keel. The sea is both friend and enemy, and the seamanship consists in using the resources of a traditional manner of behavior in order to make a friend of every hostile occasion. Self-government, democratic government, is a never-ending process. Or to put it in a slightly uh, more humorous tone, I don't know how many of you listen to Prairie Home Companion. But one of my favorite uh, pseudo sponsors of Prairie Home Companion is the National Duct Tape Council, whose motto is, in the long run, all solutions are temporary. In democratic, democratic government is like the Golden Gate Bridge. As soon as you finish painting it, you go back to the other end and start again, because it's already started to rust away. You can't do it once and say that's it's it's all over. Any yes, ma'am. Well, thank you. This was a little different from what we you know have had before, so it's kind of taken me a while to think of what are we supposed to get out of this as hopefully future leaders. And my question is, um, for anyone who, who wants to go into the political field and have good intentions to make change. Well, we all know you can't just go and be honest and everything will be good. You have to work with other people. Um, how, what is your advice to anyone who's going into that field or any other field where you need to keep your honest, good intentioned goals you know, in front of you, but still compromise with the people around you without becoming a what, what do you think? Near the, uh, near the end of his presidency, when he was giving the sort of the final round of interviews with all of the uh, network anchors, Ronald Reagan said something like this. There are some of my conservative supporters who are disappointed with what I've done in my eight years in office. <clears throat> they would rather that I had gone down in flames than to get 65 or 70 percent of what I think should be done. Uh, one of the, uh, especially in democratic politics, um, in which you know, President Obama is finding this right now, in terms of health care reform, there's, a, there's an old line that comes from uh, uh, Scottish writers that says this, society is the product of human choice but not human design. What does that mean? That means unless you are a total despot and can control everything, nothing that you accomplish in politics is going to be exactly what you would want. That's true of every, the, the revolution, the Constitutional Convention. James Madison was at points at despair during the Constitutional Convention because some of the provisions that he thought was most crucial to this new government, especially proportional representation in both the House and the Senate, were lost. And he thought that was the end of it. Politics is about not compromise for the sake of compromise, but it's about achieving not... How many of you have read, uh, been in a political philosophy course where you've read parts of uh, Plato's Republic and some Aristotle, right? Well, what, <clears throat> what Socrates is interested in finding is the best regime, pos the, the best regime, period. What Aristotle is interested in is finding the best regime possible. What can we actually achieve, right? And you've all heard the old saying, right, that uh, 
don't, uh, don't let the ideal be the enemy of the good, right? That is, if you hold out for absolute perfection, you don't get anything. So I think you have to be realistic. You also have to realize, I was, last night at dinner I was telling them, years ago I used to have one, had one of these uh, calendars. It was, a, it was a calendar full of maxims. Every day you'd pull off and there'd be another little saying, you know, like Murphy's Law. And uh, my favorite for the entire year was one called Hank's Law of the Real World. Have any of you ever heard Hank's Law of the Real World? It's very simple. And it says, in politics, sometimes the jackasses are on your side. You know, politi we all know that politics makes strange bedfellows. What we generally won't admit are sometimes we're in that bed. And it seems to me that, that um, understanding that politics is, the, is trying to do the best you can. I also think it's very important that that, uh, that uh, second of uh, Brian's phrases, confidence. I think confidence is good as long as it's not arrogance, and one of the things that really upsets me in the, the direction of our contemporary domestic politics is the demonization of opponents. If you, I mean, and, and maybe the two worst in my mind, I, I don't why I try to avoid that stuff. I stick to things that I can understand like uh, ESPN. So, uh, but on the one hand, Fox News, and on the other hand, MSNBC. You know, I just, they cannot, neither can admit that there could be a decent bone in any opponent's body. And it seems to me that uh, one of the things I have had the uh, privilege of meeting at a fellow institution of yours a few years ago, some of you, has, has Gary been up here to talk to you? Yeah, Gary Gregg's uh, uh, McConnell Center a few years ago. And one of the fun things in going there, you know, that is underwritten by Senator Mitch McConnell, but it's a nonpartisan uh, effort also, and they have been able to make use of, a, uh, Gary's been able to make use of uh, Senator McConnell's contacts, bring in all kinds of people from Washington, D.C. on both sides of the aisle. And one thing that McConnell told uh, Gary was, because one of the people that came in to speak was uh, Ted Kennedy, you might think, just at opposite ends. And McConnell told Gary, you know, when Ted gives me his word, I don't have to worry. There are a lot of Republicans I can't trust. They'll tell me something, they'll do something else. You know, so a, a sense of uh, confidence, but also a sense of humility, I think, is important. Right? And the, the, the people who can work across the aisle and look for the best possible solution are not the arrogant um, people but those who are willing to reach out. There's, a, there's an old saying, that is a person can accomplish an incredible amount as long as they don't care who gets the credit. That's something to think about in terms of leadership also, right? Leaders are only successful leaders because of the followers. You go to DC, all those statues of generals all over the place, they're only successful because of those names, like the name on the Vietnam Memorial of people who served and gave. So without followers, um, so I, I don't know that that answered your question. Well, thank you. Are we through? Thank you all very much for your attention. The preceding program is copyrighted by Grand Valley State University. Visit us at gvsu.edu.